I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Good evening and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some of your evening with us. Uh, we're doing something a little different tonight. I'm, my guest tonight is someone who has never been LDS. However, if you were to ever make a list of the most influential people in the Mormon Christian debate, this man, this gentleman's name would be on every list. And so I'm happy tonight to welcome Bill McKeever. Thank you, Thank you, Earl. Bill. I'm honored, I guess, to be the first Gentile to come on your show. So well, thanks. Thank you. And we'll probably have about three weeks of uh, having Bill on. We've got a lot to cover, uh, but I did want to cover a couple of things by way of introduction just a little bit. He's written or co-authored four different books, Mormonism 101, Examining the Religion of the Latter-day Saints, Questions to Ask Your Mormon Friends, and it looks like we have a little typo there, but uh, that book is also out of print, I understand. Is that mm -hmm. right, Bill? And then s third is Answering Mormon's Questions, and in their own words, a collection of Mormon quotations, and that's my favorite book. I really like that Thank one. Thank you. He also hosts a radio program twice a day at 9.45 a.m. and 9.30 p.m. on TV on uh, 8.20 a.m. radio. It's called v uh, Viewpoint on Mormonism. He and his co-host, Eric Johnson, have done over 800 programs since uh, 2011. And he's spoken at universities and churches throughout the United States, at the Kiev Theological Seminary in Russia, he's spoken in the Philippines, and he's the founder and director of Mormonism Research Ministry, MRM.org, which he started uh, about 35 years ago. 35 years, this is our Nin anniversary. 1979, mm -hmm. so, and I would dare say that Bill probably knows more about Mormonism than 98, 99 percent of Mormons, and that would include me. So <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate you yeah. coming and sharing uh, what I'm sure will be very interesting to everyone that yeah, know, yeah. knows you and, and uh, respects you so much. But as we usually do, give us just a little bit of your background. Where were you born and where, did you, where were you raised? Well, I, and I was uh, actually born in North Carolina. My father was in 82nd Airborne, so oh. uh, my mom was in a hospital at the time I was born. I wanted to be close to my mother, so I was born <laughs> in a hospital. Uh, but uh, we moved out to California not long after I was born. Okay. And it was basically in California that I spent most of my life. I, I've been in Utah now since 2004. Okay. Uh, not that I was unfamiliar with Utah, because we used to, I used to come up here all the time for doing various outreaches and things. Yeah. So I was very familiar with it. It wasn't yeah. much of a culture shock. I, I kind of understood how the streets worked. If, <laughs> if they say east and west, they really go north and south. Right. And if they say north and south, they go east and west. So <laughs> that's something that tourists normally <laughs> don't figure out till they leave. Yeah, and the, yeah. the 3300 and the 3900 yeah, yeah. and all that. And, uh, ground zero. So you went to high school then in, in California? In California, uh, yeah, I went to Grand Hills High School. I had a lot of LDS friends. They never really tried to convert me. Uh, no. I, we never, I can't even recall even having any real in-depth discussions on religion at all. Uh, my high school years, I would, 
probably, if you asked me at that time, I probably would have said I was an atheist, although I, I really? think every atheist has a what if in the back of their head, <laughs> but it's fashionable to say that, especially nowadays. Yeah. Uh, but Mom I really dad? didn't own any faith. Yeah. During Mom and dad, what were, were they religious? Uh, at all? My father died when I was very young. I was about six. Uh, oh, my mom gosh. didn't remarry until I was in the eighth grade. Oh, okay. And uh, so he was not a, a religious person. My mom at the time was really not religious at all. Oh. So I didn't really have any uh, strong religious training except what I chose. And what I might say about that is that my family was primarily Catholic, but we never really went, mm -hmm. uh, especially after my father mm -hmm. died. We went for a little while, kind of tapered off. I did go to some catechism classes <laughs> during junior high and such, but lost interest in that. Mm -hmm. um, but during my high school years, my senior year especially, I was working at a gas station uh, during the week. I would get out of school early because I was a senior, okay. I had the yeah. typical senioritis. <laughs> but a, a friend and I were actually running a gas station for a company. He would work in the mornings and I would come and work in the afternoons and then close it up around seven. He was a Christian. He oh, started really? sharing his faith with me and at the same time uh, I, I knew a girl from high school who was also a Christian who was sharing her faith with me. So I was kind of getting it from both sides. Um, didn't really make a profession of faith during high school. Yeah. Uh, not at all. I had other interests. I was very much into racing motorcycles at the time, wow. and so dirt bikes was my thing, and yeah. I didn't have time for God. And besides, <laughs> who's going to go to church on Sunday when I have races on Sunday? Yeah. So it wasn't until after I graduated from high school, I went up to Montana in West Yellowstone. I was working at a sawmill up there. I was a green chain operator hated that job. That was one of the worst yeah. jobs you could it ever have. Sounds dangerous too. Oh, a little there were some yeah. times, I mean, there was one time in particular, it, it was a little hairy there when so, this conveyor belt and all this lumber coming down yeah, at I me and, and uh, it, 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 <laughs> you could get hurt. But I remember um, it was there that I, I met a, a guy who worked with me at the mill and one night we were discussing religion hmm. and uh, two two non-experts on religion <laughs> discussing as if we were experts on religion. But I remember something specifically that he said, I don't know how the subject came up, but he said to me that Mormonism was a cult. Really? Out of the blue, he says this. I, I didn't really even know what he meant. Mm. I, I kid and say, well, it was a four letter word. I knew it couldn't be good, <laughs> but I didn't really understand why he said that because my experiences with Hell my Mormon on. friends were all positive. positive. I, I never had any really negative yeah. experiences with my Mormon friends at all. Those didn't come about until later when I started <laughs> trying to talk to them about their faith. Yeah. Um, but I was very curious as to what he meant by that. I attended a, a small church up there occasionally a in Christian West church? Yellowstone. A yes, it Christian was a West Yellowstone Baptist Church. Okay and didn't really make any profession of faith at that time. It was mulling over a lot of the things that my friend from high school that worked with me at the gas yeah. station had told me. In fact, he gave me my, my first New Testament. Really? To, sh to show you, Earl, how <laughs> dumb I was when it comes to the New Testament, I, I remember reading the Gospels, wondering why are a lot of these stories the same? You know, oh. <laughs> you know that, that, that <laughs> they didn't Repeating. understand synoptics at right. the time. Oh, that's um, but when I, Moved back to California after living in West Yellowstone. Started getting cold up there, so this California yeah. boy heads back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I started attending a small church, and uh, through this uh, one girl that I knew, and that was a church that she was attending at the time, and uh, it was at that church that I actually made a profession of faith. It wasn't any type of lightning bolt conversion for me. It yeah. wasn't any type of dramatic thing at all. I had been contemplating a lot of the claims that I had been hearing from my Christian friends, the necessity of trusting in a Savior and the fact that I was a sinner, I had come short of the glory of God. So I was mulling over a lot of these things and had to convince myself first that the Bible was a, a book that was worth believing. Mm -hmm. Now. Certainly since becoming a Christian and definitely dealing with apologetic subjects, I've come across a lot more of the criticisms of the Bible that I obviously knew back then in my late teens. Yeah. But at least I had done at least some remedial study enough to convince me that a lot of these stories in the Bible 
at least had some valid uh, some historical validity right, right. and trust. I still and I still hold to that position today that even though you can't prove empirically things like whether or not your sins are forgiven there are stories in the Bible that can be yeah. I would say supported sure. empirically through archaeological and historical evidence right. when <coughs> I got to that point I, I started taking seriously the spiritual in implications. And how of old are you at this? I'm, point? I'm only about 18 at this time. Yeah, so still so a I'm, young I'm still person. Pretty young. Yeah. And uh, but I, I started attending this small church. Um, the preaching was pretty straight and forward. Yeah. And uh, I, I ended up making a profession of faith there, and that's really what started my my wow. Christian walk. Wow. And at the same time. I started coming in contact with a lot of Mormon acquaintances, different ones than I knew okay. in high school. Okay. And as we started discussing a lot of spiritual things, because now as a young Christian, I, I'm excited about this. I want to talk about this. So, I, and I'm remembering what that friend of mine said yeah, in that, West Yellowstone too. Cult, right? Up there. And uh, and so I, I started talking to my new acquaintances about these things, and the more we talked the more concerned I became is really the the feeling if I was to describe it that would be the word that I concerned for them concerned for them that you didn't know certain concerned for them. For, for them because what little I had understood about the Christian faith up until that point I could see that there was something significantly significantly different in than what they were telling me and when it came to a lot of the basics of the Christian faith my Mormon friends didn't agree with them they, they certainly did not believe in some of the basics of the historic Christian faith, the, the doctrine of the Trinity or, or salvation by grace through faith alone. Yeah. Uh, they denied all these teachings. Right. Of course, their, their view of the hereafter was very different. Their view of scripture was very different. Yeah. Now, when they would throw questions at me, naturally being a fairly new believer, I didn't have a lot of ready answers for them. So I would take their questions and I would do the usual, and I still do this sometimes, I'll say, you know, I don't have an answer for that. Can I get back to you? Yeah. And I would go and I would find the answers Study for these. And, and as I started looking for those answers, I started realizing there are some really good responses to what my Mormon friends are telling me they believe. <laughs> this Bible, I kept, it was just, to use a, a famous Mormon expression, is very faith promoting. <laughs> And, and I started finding out that there was a, a lot of stuff in that Bible that really had the answers that for my Mormon questions. friends. Isn't that amazing? And that's really how it all started with me. It was just more on an individual basis. Wow. Talking with my Mormon acquaintances. And as the years went by, uh, other people, because I was just so immersed and fascinated with this religion, I ended up buying a book. Uh, I think my first book on Mormonism was a book by a man by the name of Gordon Frazier, okay. who was a Christian missionary on a Navajo reservation. And he wrote this book as a result of Mormon missionaries coming on the Navajo River reservation trying to proselytize the Navajos on that reservation. Oh, okay. Well, because they would think that those were Lamanites. Sure. Yeah. So he wrote this book on, on Mormonism. I bought it mainly because I wanted to see the books he was referring to. And For who he was quoting. Who he was quoting, okay. the, the sources. Yeah. And uh, so I started buying some of those books and reading them for myself. So a lot of my study actually came from primary sources, not from books about Mormonism. They were actually books written by Mormons. Yeah. So when a Mormon says, well, you were just tainted by those anti-Mormon books, that really wasn't my case. Yeah. Um, in fact, even today, most of my library are Mormon books. I have very, really very few, relatively very few books written about Mormonism by Mormons. And the only reason I have what I have really is most of them people have given me over the year. I haven't even read them. Yeah. But that is what fascinated me. Well, and it's interesting that God would kind of use you or touch your heart, soften your heart toward the Latter-day Saints. It's interesting. I would say it was because of those friendships I had with them during my school years. You respected them, I guess, and felt like they, they were, were good, good people. Friends. Good people. They, they were really good friends. Yeah. And, and as I said, I never had any negative experiences with them. They're good people. I still say that. Yeah. See, a lot of times people will write me and say, well, why, why are you saying such bad things about the Mormons? I say, well, what have I said? I have 
bad things <laughs> to say about Mormonism. Ism, yeah. You know, but for the most part, Mormons are are really great people. Wow. And, and it some, sometimes I think it bothers them when I actually say that because yeah. it kind of takes the whole reason why we do what we do uh, away from them because many Mormons, I think, just have to have a persecution complex. And feel like you have some axe yes. to grind and yeah. some, something. That was never my motivation. Yeah. It was always wanting to not only educate my fellow Christians on the doctrines of Mormonism and how to share your faith with them, but my, also my desire was to share directly my faith with the Mormon people to learn where they're coming from and how to respond to the things yeah. that made them what they are. Yeah. And uh, that's what we've been doing now for officially 35 years. I really started studying Mormonism probably closer to around 1974. Yeah. So it's, it's been a while. Well, I know there's a story here about a friend of yours, uh, an LDS friend who had a set of Journal of Discourses that uh, you had a chance to go in and kind of look at the sources. Tell yeah, us about he, that story. Yeah, he, he wasn't so much a friend as, oh. as an acquaintance through work. Okay. He, he worked with um, uh, the, the there were I was working at a hardware store at this time. And this hardware store uh, had a lot of accounts with the local Mormon chapels and, and places. So their maintenance guys would come into this store and they would get pipe cut and they would get supplies, you know, for the maintenance of their buildings. And so uh, I got to know a lot of these guys. And so I was talking to one of them as I was probably cutting pipe for him or doing something, just waiting on him. And I had mentioned to him that I was interested in wanting to see a set of Journal of Discourses that I had never actually seen them, but I had read a lot about them and I wanted to verify some of the things that I had read. And so he said he had a set, so he invited me to come over and Sunday afternoon he was eating dinner with his family and so I was allowed to go into his den and, and go through them and I had a whole list of quotes and references that, you wanted to look up, that I, I wanted guess. to verify. Yeah. Yeah. And what basically happened is when he was done and I was pretty much finished, he asked me if I found what I wanted and I said yeah and uh, I kind of expressed that I was again concerned <laughs> by what I had read. And uh, I remember when in our conversation, his demeanor changed drastically. When he saw that I was not having a very good experience reading the Journal the of Discourses. original quotes and yes, stuff, yeah. His demeanor changed quite drastically. And I remember him saying something to the effect that, you know, when he died, he hoped to become a god. You know, what do you have to offer me? Wow. And, I remember my answer, I was kind of thrown off by that. I, I said, well, gee, all, all I have is Jesus, you know. And uh, kind of a... Great <laughs> answer, really. Yeah, yeah. You, I guess. You know, I kind of thought it was lame at the time because, wow, he's going to be a god. All that's I quite have a, is quite Jesus. A, yeah, all I had was Jesus. And he said, he said to me, that's not good enough. And at that, time, at that time, he went to the door, opened the door, and basically was ushering me out. Oh my goodness. It was the weirdest experience. Uh, I had never been treated like that. Yeah. But it really opened my eyes to just how serious some of the Latter-day Saint people take this and and how quickly they shut down. Too, yes. Don't they? Yeah. That's what what shocked me the most. Yeah. Is as soon as I guess he saw that I was not enamored with his faith, yeah. it changed everything. Yeah. And it was, it was just uh, one of the oddest experiences I, I had at that time. Wow. Uh, but it didn't stop my studying. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it, I, I still hold to this, just because I feel that he didn't treat me as good as he possibly could have, yeah. that does not tell me that Mormonism must be wrong because of that. Sure. And I know a lot of Latter-day Saints will look at bad examples of Christians as somehow that's a um, proof, or yeah, something. proof that, yeah. that Christianity must not yeah. be true. And, and yeah. that would certainly be erroneous. Uh, there's a lot of other reasons that Mormonism isn't true besides that. Yeah. Well, more on a more personal note, now where does Tammy come in in your life? Well, Tammy was actually the daughter of the pastor of the church oh, my where goodness. I made that profession of faith. Oh, was she? Yeah, I never really knew her in high school. I knew her brother. Did she okay. go to the same high school? We went to the same high school, 
but oh. I really didn't know her that well at all. I was probably closer to her brother, who was my age. Wow. Uh, but Tammy uh, and I, of course, eventually got married. Yeah. And um, 30, she- 39 years, right? Been 39 years this last August. And, and thank you. And um, you know, three grown kids, uh, proud of them all, eight grandkids. My son Good just got married and, uh, wow. and we're just excited about that. Yeah. And, um, so all my kids are married off now. Uh, but Tammy uh, really, <laughs> you want to say it, she kind of runs Mormonism Research Does Ministry. She? Oh yeah, she's yeah. the office manager and she manages it quite she well. Sure she you're, you're where you're supposed she's to She's got be. it all <laughs> together. I, I did a lot of that yeah. up until about, oh, a little over 10 years ago and it just became so overwhelming. And then Tammy was working with our high school ministry at our church where we were going in uh, California. And then she came on to handle the ministry, and yeah. she's been doing a great job ever since. Oh. I know there's another book that kind of came into your life, the Book of Mormon Examined. Tell us a little bit about how that was that written by Art Bedvarsson. Yeah, yeah, it I, was. It I was originally uh, titled, I think it was Book of Mormon Examined. I went to go look for that book at our local Christian bookstore in La Mesa, California, uh, which is a suburb of San Diego. The owner, Katie was her name, couldn't find it. And then she realized it was under another name. And, she, and then she said to me, she says, well, you know, the man that wrote that book lives right here in La Mesa. <laughs> His name is Art Bedvarsson. And, and I knew the name, you yeah. know, but Art Bedvarsson was the author of the book. And I said, really? And so I went home, I looked up A. Bedvarsson in the phone book. Yeah. And I just, there out of the was, blue, huh? called him up. Yeah. And I says, is this the Arthur Bedvarsson <clears throat> who wrote this book? And he said yes. And that phone call started a very long friendship. Okay. Even though we were separated by decades yeah. in our age, uh, his, his wife, Edna, and Art became very good friends yeah. of my wife, Tammy, and, and me. And he was a great help in helping me understand how Mormons think where they're kind of coming from, because I didn't have that kind of experience, never yeah. being a Mormon, so he helped in that. And oh. ironically, Edna was born in Manti. Oh, she which was. Which is where I've been going every summer since yeah. 1991, doing a lot of ministry down yeah. there. And uh, she was actually born there. I uh, had the bittersweet honor of doing both of their funerals. And, that understood uh, that he they, passed away. They passed away. Now, you've, you've interviewed Edna. I or did. On, on Viewpoint on Mormonism, I uh, noticed, No, I actually, I, I interviewed her on a cassette. Oh my goodness. We've never aired it. Oh, and I've talked you? with Eric about possibly doing that, oh. if the cassette is even still, you know. Viable. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah. know. The, the hard part would be finding a machine to play it. Um, but I've never had Edna on, on the show, and I probably should play that, because I had an interesting story. Oh. Uh, getting a gospel track handed to them when they went to go visit someone at a local hospital. Wow. Gospel of John, that track changed Edna's life. Art was a little slow. It took him yeah. about eight years to come around. You know how guys are. But so. I understand Art was also the person that did, I guess, I don't know the story completely, but the Utah Christian, Christian Track, track Society. Society. Now, it actually, somewhere in the back of my mind, I had heard or seen these little blue and white mm -hmm pamphlets and I couldn't even name one. I don't even know where I saw it, but somewhere in my life, in my youth, yeah. I must have seen a little blue and white pamphlet. Don't, don't, I don't think I read it. They had tens of thousands of those printed. Placed all just over. gave them away. Here in Utah and, and California. All over the place, yeah. but you're right. They started Utah Christian Tract Society back in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had an uh, incredible impact on a lot of of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Uh, they were really one of the, I would say, one of the first uh, ministries that really focused just on Mormonism. There were some others yeah. that came about, but uh, they had an incredible ministry. They were very good friends of ours. Yeah. I could tell from, from your writing and from, from what you had said about them that that was a rich friendship and oh, something that you cherished. And yeah. Uh, it's sad to see them go, but back to the Lord, right? Oh, <laughs> definitely. The Lord, oh, right? they had such a relationship with Jesus. It was incredible. Yeah. Well, speaking of Tammy again, uh, did she think you were nuts with all this uh, passion for the Mormons? 
Latter Day Saints? Did she say, no, let's let's go she find? She might think I'm that way now. Well, I, I don't know back then. No, you know, um, she was okay with. Before your we married, I I didn't really know where I was going, but I just you know you just kind of had this feeling that you might be going in some type of a ministry direction. I really didn't have any clear clue as to what that was. If you would have told me back then that I'd be doing this, I probably, probably would have rolled my eyes. Very surprised. Like, really? Uh, but it, it didn't bother her. Being in a uh, uh, the home of a pastor, she yeah. was very familiar with what ministry was all about and the sacrifices yeah. that come with it. Yeah. And so she's really she's been, been good so about supportive. That. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's wonderful. Absolutely. Well, Bill, Believe it or not, our first session is almost over, and, I, and we're going to visit with Bill for a couple more weeks here and get into some topics and some of the things that maybe were here when he began his ministry and then some of the changes that he's observed over the last 35 years, I guess. Yeah. So um, uh, let's see. I uh, Maybe just to kind of conclude this one, uh, this session is, is tell us what you've what questions do you like to ask the Latter-day Saints to make them think? Just a couple, maybe. The one I like to eventually gear the conversation toward is having to do with their knowledge and assurance of knowing whether or not they're forgiven. Uh, I forgiven? Forgiven. That's an interesting... Uh, I, I firmly believe the trademark of every Christian is the fact that you are forgiven. Heaven is only going to be occupied by humans who have been forgiven. Through the shed blood of Jesus. Absolutely. And I had a conversation re recently with a Latter-day Saint who insisted that Jesus was his savior but didn't know if he was forgiven. And I had to keep reminding him and I wouldn't let go. <laughs> you cannot have Jesus as your savior if you don't know you're forgiven. You're we, presumptuous at best. That's all. That's yes. his whole mission. Absolutely. Was to pay for our sins. Matthew one twenty one. He came to save his people from their sins. Yeah. And if a Mormon wants to claim Jesus as their savior, they need to be forgiven. And yet, that's one area that I find most Latter Day Saints are reluctant to say they are, <laughs> because they have not done what they are taught is required in order to gain that forgiveness. Well, I know you've covered the the book, uh, President Kimball's book, Miracle of Forgiveness. Uh, oh, no, yeah. How many sessions? Do you think? Oh, we did over 40 radio shows on 40 the radio of shows yeah. on the miracle of forgiveness mm -hmm. and all having to do really with this whole pro concept of repentance and forgiveness and and not We figure if Mormons are told to read that book and that was said to them in conference on at least two occasions then yeah. I think it's a good book to use and, and I love using miracle of forgiveness in witnessing situations. <laughs> Well, again, thanks, Bill, for, for tonight, and we'll look forward to visiting with you again next week, and uh, we, we appreciate your, all, you, all that you do. You've Thank done you. so much. He's, he's conducted symposiums. There's been six of them held just in the last couple of months as you watch this, and he'll, there'll be more coming. So we look forward to next week, and we'll talk to you. See you next week on the Ex-Mormon Files. Good night.